Good morning. It is Monday morning, and I am so glad that we are here and that we're able to have Bible study, and um, uh, it's the start of fall, and so everything feels fresh and new, and so <clears throat> today we are going to have a great time in God's Word. We're going to be looking at Psalm um, 85 today, so grab your Bible and uh, get your cup of coffee or whatever it is that you like to drink in the morning. And let's just get started. Father, I thank you for this day. Lord, I thank you for your glorious word. I thank you for your mercy. I thank you for your peace. I thank you for your comfort. And Lord, today as we open your word and as we study your word, I pray, Lord, that you would be with all those who need healing today, those who need comfort today. And that your sweet Holy Spirit would invade us with comfort and peace today. I thank you that you are continuing to show mercy to this land. In Christ's name, amen, amen, amen. All right, I know that today is Carolyn Lee's birthday. And today is Barbara uh, White's birthday today. So who else has a birthday today? Um, let's see, anybody have on a birthday today besides Carolyn Lee and um, Carolyn Lee Wright, she goes to our church, good friend of mine, and uh, Barbara, oh, there's Barbara, good morning, oh, you're 69, happy birthday, Barbara, happy birthday, so um, I, I didn't have any more Little Debbies because I threw those away with the insistence of my children. And so uh, today I have this uh, banana nut bread that I made and uh, heavy on the bread part of it. And then I put some uh, Cool Whip on it so it would look festive. So, oops. So Barbara, so Barbara and to Carolyn, um, happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Carolyn and Barbara, and whoever else is having a birthday today. Happy birthday to you. And now I'm going to blow it out for you. May all your blessings happen. All right. This Wednesday is when we are having um, uh, Barbara, uh, not Barbara White, Francis Krause's birthday party. It will be at the church. Oh, Carolyn, you're still in Williamsburg. All right, girl, have a good time. Uh, this is when we will have Francis Krause's birthday party, and it will be at the church at 5.30. It's a drive-by. If you are not able, oh, you have sound now, good, Linda. If you are not able to drive by, then you can send her a card or a gift, or you could drop it off at the church, it's 6700 Bock, B-O-C-K, Road, Fort Washington, Maryland, 20744. So Carolyn says that looks so good. So um, Carolyn, I don't know if you want banana nut bread. And again, uh, I made this because I was, my bananas were starting to get a little soft. So you can see the banana. But then I got, a little carried away. I thought I was being cute. And I made some praline pecans and put those on the top. But uh, they must have been too heavy because they kind of sank to the bottom. So it's kind of like a, a pineapple upside down cake, only it's banana cake with on the bottom caramelized pecans. So I, I don't know. I thought it was delicious. And um, hey, Judith, good morning. And our uh, media people seem to enjoy it. So, uh, you get to choose when it's your birthday. You get to choose. All right. Uh, so today we're going to look at Psalm 85. I'm just going to tell you this necklace is so cute with this sweater. Isn't that cute? But it's banging on this table, so I'm going to take it off. I mean, I want you to get a good look because it's super cute. All right, here we go. Psalm 85. <clears throat> Now, this is from the Sons of Korah, and uh, we remember that when we talked about the Sons of Korah before, that was a tribe, that was a group, and uh, when they came out and they were the enemies of Israel, 
God just destroyed all of the warriors. But the families that survived that, the families that he allowed to survive that, um, they came into the temple and they became musicians and they became uh, a great part of the ones who wrote many of our uh, psalms because they were worshipers, they were the song leaders. And so that's who we are dealing with today. So Psalm 85, and it's a song, and it starts with, you showed favor in your land, O Lord. You showed favor in your land, O Lord. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. You forgave the iniquity of your people and covered all their sins. Listen what God has done for Israel. He has shown favor to the actual land. Shown favor to the actual land. And so I want us to think about, uh, I Googled this morning, what is the most fertile land in America? And I've always thought that it was uh, up in Pennsylvania, up in Lancaster, where the, where the Amish are. And that is a very, very, very fertile, fertile, fertile part of America. But uh, according to Siri, I think it was Iowa that uh, is what Siri told me. So I want us to think of very fertile ground. I mean, you've blessed that land. When I go over to John and Lisa's house, our son and daughter-in-law up in Rockville, they have this backyard. And when they first looked at their backyard, it was kind of one of those what can we ever do with this backyard? And they've turned it into like the Garden of Eden. I mean, it is surrounded by um, beautiful gardens that they've put in. Uh, Lisa has done all of the flowers, and John and Abby have done all of these vegetables, and they've planted apple trees, and they've planted cherry trees. So here's this here's this yard, and it, honestly, it looks like God has blessed that yard. And when you go out into their backyard, you know, it's it's fenced in, it's it's completely enclosed by fence, and so here's this yard that is just a fertile, beautiful place, and it, honestly, God has favored that land. When we say God bless our land, I mean, normally we're talking about all of the people, and, and it does mean that, but right here, he's talking about you've actually favored the land, and then you've restored the fortunes of Jacob. That means you've brought these people back from captivity. You've restored their fortunes. So we want to think about how we have been in bondage, how we have been tied up, how we have been kept apart from our blessings, how we have been, uh, in some cases, you know, because of some uh, situation, we've, we've lost things that belong to us, and how grateful we are. When we come out of that bondage, maybe, maybe we were in addiction. Maybe one of our children has gone through addiction. And, and when they come out of that, it's, it's just unbelievable. It's God truly showing his faithfulness, his true faithfulness. You've restored us. You've brought back those from captivity. You forgave <clears throat> the iniqui iniquity of your people and covered all their sins. So we've, we've talked about actual land. We've talked about people coming out of bondage. And then it says, uh, and you've forgiven the iniquity of your people. That means you've restored relationship. God is all about relationship or else he would have just kept the Garden of Eden like it was. I mean, <clears throat> it would have been so much easier on him. But he desired relationship. And so he created us. He put us out here into this beautiful world. And, and these men who are praising him in this song and the Israelites who would praise him through this song, they said, you've, you've restored our land. You've, you've taken care of our people and we've got this relationship. And could it be that it's because you've delivered us from all our sins? So he's talking about here he's talking about actual land, people in bondage, relationship, and deliverance. Doesn't that sound like what we want in America right now? Doesn't that sound like what we want in America right now? I mean, 
there's there's storm damage, there's fires going, there's other uh, catastrophic natural events happening in America, and and haven't we been saying, you know, God heal this land? Uh, yes, the people, but heal our land, heal our land, and then God, please deliver us out of this bondage that we've all allowed to fall ourselves uh, allowed ourselves to fall into we, there's the bondage of fear there's the bondage of lying there's the bondage of unforgiveness all of these bondages that we need to come out of heal our land heal us set us free and then god restore this relationship with you Restore this relationship with you and bring us deliverance. I think that ex describes what three is talking about. I'm in Psalm 85, three today. You set aside all your wrath and turned from your fierce anger. I think once, once we ask him for forgiveness, once he has covered our sins, once we have asked for deliverance from our sins, he turns his face away from his anger and looks back at us. And he turns around. When we call out on the name of Jesus, he immediately turns to us. Immediately turns to us. Then in Psalm 85, 4, it says, Restore us again, O God, our Savior, and put away your displeasure towards us. Revive us. Revive us. Uh, restore us back into your sight, back into your pleasure. Restore us. And that the only way we can do that is say, Revive us. Give us revival. Give us revival in our homes. Give us revival in our churches. And, and, you know, a lot of times people are saying, well, you just don't see revival in church anymore. And I'm just going to tell you that if you walk in the door and you have revival in you, revival's in the church. If you give yourself up to worship instead of sitting there thinking, how much longer can this go on? Or if you're sitting in church and you're saying, I'm just going to, I'm just going to check. Hold on. Let me just check this one quick reference uh, that has absolutely nothing to do with church. But, uh, and then you catch yourself 15 minutes looking up and saying, oh, dang, I missed the whole service. Revive us, O oh Lord, and let it begin with me. Oh, let it begin with me. Revive us and let it begin with me. Revive us, O oh Lord. Restore us, O oh God of our salvation, and put away your displeasure toward us. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger through all generations? Will you not revive us again? that your people may rejoice in you. Show us your unfailing love, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. First of all, we know that we can only get this salvation, this restoration through God. That's it. People are all the time trying to find ways to find restoration and find ways to find salvation. And, and they're going to all these different places and they're going to all these different people and, and they're looking for restoration. And this is saying we acknowledge it can only come from you, O oh God, our Savior. O oh God, our Savior. O oh God, our Savior. I'm calling on you. I, if, I, if I call on the government to rescue me from this situation and I don't get rescued, here's why. That's not my salvation. If I call on my husband to rescue me out of a state of disbelief, I've called on the wrong person. He can pray for me. He can anoint me. He can give me scripture. But my salvation 
only can come from God. The restoration of my spirit can only come from God. Revival in my life can only come from God. Do I call on people when I'm sick or when I need prayer? Absolutely I do. Absolutely I do. I'm very careful who I call on, but yes, I do. Do I have people for, who pray for me all the time? Yes, I do. Many of you are watching right now. Many of you have been praying for me for years and years, and I love it. I love it, and I feel it. But if I need revival, if you need revival in your own life, in your home, in your family, if you need revival, then you can only call on the God who can restore, the God who can revive. Bless his holy name. Restore us, O oh God. The first thing we have to do is we have to recognize that we need restoration. We need restoration. I have, I have a really, really good friend, Katie, Katie Inman, Katie Dickinson Inman. And she and I had been out somewhere all day. I don't remember what the situation was, but we'd, we'd been gone all day and we got home. We got home and I, I went to the bathroom and my hair was literally just sticking straight up. So I came out and I said, could you not have told me how long has my hair been sticking up like that? And she said, I thought you liked it like that. I thought that's how you had it styled. And honestly, that's fair. <laughs> that's fair. <clears throat> that somebody would think I had my hair sticking straight up on purpose. And so, here's the thing. Here's my point. Only you, only you can recognize that you need help. Only you can recognize that you need restoration. Only you can recognize that you need revival. Only you can recognize that you have sin in your life and that you need to get that rid of that so that God would not be displeased with you. You know when you are doing something that is displeasing to God. You know it. So these men, this psalm is saying, will you prolong your anger through all generations? But then it says, will you not revive us again? Keyword, again. You've done it before. You've done it before. God, you've done it before. You've sent revival into my life before. You've sent revival into my family before. You've, I've seen revival. I used to sit, uh, my granddad Carol uh, would talk to us about services that he was going to, and he would talk about how he saw actual, you know, fire over somebody's head. And then listen, um, at my age, I'm right behind you there, Barbara, at my age, I have seen miracles and miracles and miracles in my life. I've seen him do it. I've seen him do it. Once when we were in Knoxville in, uh, in an auditorium, uh, TL had been on a 40-day fast, and I sat on that stage, and I saw a cloud come into that auditorium. I saw this with my own eyes. It wasn't me imagining. It wasn't an air conditioning condensation situation. I saw a cloud come into the back of that auditorium, and as it came forward, people were falling under the Holy Spirit's con uh, uh, that cloud. They were just falling. People were dropping to their knees. People were crying out under that cloud of Shekinah glory. I've seen that myself. So if I want to say to God, I want to see revival, and here's the thing. I've seen it before. I know what it looks like. I felt it in my life. I have seen things in my life where he has revived things that I thought were dead and gone a long time ago. Revival, revival. Do it again. Then it says, I'm in Psalm 85 and I'm at 8. I will listen to what God the Lord will say. I started to say, <laughs> have you ever known somebody who kind of did all the talking and you had to wait until your turn? But I think I'm that person. 
So thank you to all of you who will wait me out. We need to go before God and we need to talk to him and we need to praise him and we need to present our petitions and then we need to listen. I'm, I'm going to talk and then I'm going to listen. I'm going to listen to what God has to say. I'm going to listen to what God has to say. When my boys were um, maybe eight and 10, I don't remember where our girls were, but we the boys were about eight and 10. We were down in Tennessee and Steve and I took my mom uh, and we went way up into Ducktown, uh, Copper Hill, all of those areas up there in, in Tennessee. And um, my mother, not a big talker. My daddy, yes, but my mother, not so much. But my mother talked that day to our boys and to me and Steve about her family and about their life and about how they lived up uh, in those areas and, and what it was like. And I just listened. I just soaked it in. After Steve's granddad died, we were down at Grandmother Woodard's house and she came into the bedroom with us. Sweetest, sweetest, sweetest little grandmother. Sweetest little grandmother. And she sat down on the bed with us. And she took Steve's hand and she held it in her little hand. And she sat and she talked to us for three hours about her life. And we didn't say anything. We just sat and listened. Steve has said, a thousand times. Why didn't I record that? But we didn't know that we were doing anything that was going to be monumental. We were just sitting and listening. When God speaks, we have to be quiet and listen. That's, that's how that works. I will listen to God the Lord, what he will say. He promises peace. He promises peace to his people, to his saints. But let them not return to folly. So he's telling us, stay humble, stay surrendered. Surely his salvation is near those who fear him. Now this isn't like surely this is going to happen. This is like for sure. For sure. His salvation is near to those who fear him. It's there. That his glory may dwell in in our land. He takes his people. He talks to them. We listen. Then there's glory in the land. There's glory in the land. There's salvation in the land. There's deliverance in the land. I love these next four verses. I just love them. I, and I have for a long time. It says, love and faithfulness meet together. There's love and there's faithfulness, and they meet together. And then I love this one. Righteousness and peace kiss each other. Righteousness, a series of this, is the quality of being morally right or justifiably able to show to be right or reasonable. The quality of being morally right the quality of being morally right. So the quality of being morally right meets with peace and they kiss each other. Faithfulness springs forth from the earth. Faithfulness, not, not lying, not deceitfulness, not broken promises. Faithfulness will spring forth from the earth. Think if you've ever been to a, a fountain or a spring or if you've been out to Yellowstone and see those Geysers gush forth, faithfulness just gushing out, faithfulness just gushing out, faithfulness coming out, and it's, you know, Old Faithful, that's Old Faithful out at uh, Yellowstone, I've, I've been there once, and they have a schedule there, they have a schedule there, and people, this is not a Disney show, this is a, an act of nature, and you go out there and you say, oh, well, uh, it's the next time it's going to gush, and, and I'm not talking about, 
I'm not talking about when you open a soda. I'm talking about get out of the way. You know, it's it's huge. It's massive. Stay well, well, well behind the, the fences that they have there for us to stand behind. Don't let your children get close. Faithful is getting ready to burst. Faithfulness is getting ready to gush. And it's not just once. It's every, I think, 30 minutes. I've forgotten how often it does. I've forgotten how often it does. But it's like... There goes the old faithful. Faithfulness. Faithfulness gushing forth from the earth. And righteousness looks down from heaven. God is looking down on us. The Lord will indeed give us what is good. Indeed. Our son John says that all the time, that word. If he agrees with you, he'll say, indeed. I think it's because he lived in Canada for a while. I'm not sure. But I'd love to hear him say it. Because if I say something to John and he says, indeed, that means he's saying absolutely. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. If if you uh, <clears throat> uh, if I want you here at five, can you be here? Indeed. And if John says he's going to be here at five, he's here. So this is saying, indeed, give us what is good. Oh, you need, you need something good? And, and did God tell you he was going to give it to you? Well, indeed. He's faithful. He's faithful. He's going to give it to you. He's going to give it to you. If God promised you something, now I'm not talking about, listen, I am not talking about these people who say, uh, God told me to tell you, and I'm not kidding about this. God told me to tell you that you're supposed to give me your car. Hmm. Well, here's my, here's my answer to that. Well, when God tells me to give you my car, I will give you my car. And I'll put the payment book right there in the glove box, and I will give you my car. I'm not talking about somebody saying God said something. I'm not talking about you dreaming up something you want God to give you. I'm, I'm not talking about when you say, uh, I believe God's going to give me so-and-so, uh, uh, -so, somebody else, some other woman's husband. No that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about God will indeed give you what is good. And then, and then, and then, our land will yield its harvest. Our land will yield its harvest. Our land feels barren right now in so many ways. It feels barren right now. But this is saying, God's going to give us what is good. Our land will yield its harvest. Righteousness goes before him and prepares the way for his steps. My steps are ordered. Your steps are ordered. With righteousness going before us and God going with us, who can stop us? Who can stop us? If we are truly repentant and seeking revival, truly repentant and seeking revival, if we are listening for what God has to say to us, I mean, being quiet and listening. Being quiet and listening. That scripture, I'm not sure where it is. I should have looked it up, but I just now thought of it. Where it says that we are as satisfied as a weaned child. A weaned child means that they're no longer trying to nurse. They're just sitting in their mother's lap, and they're not trying to nurse. They're satisfied. They're weaned. They're just sitting there being quiet and happy. Let me tell you something. God, God will restore. God will revive. <clears throat> but we have to repent. We have to repent. This is the time of um, Rosh Hashanah. And, <clears throat> and Yom Kippur is coming up. So, I'm not Jewish. No Jewish blood in me, I don't think except the blood of Jesus Christ. But it's a time for them for reflection. 
a time for reflection. For the Jewish people, it's a time of reflection. I think for the Christians, it should be a, a time of reflection. A time of reflection. Finding time to be quiet and just to reflect. I don't know what that looks like for you. I barely know what it looks like for me to tell you the truth, but I'm working on it. I'm really working on that. A time to just be quiet and reflect on God's word. Those of you who are sick today, and I know that there are some who are sick today, those of you who are doctor's appointments today, it's where Sally is right now. Let me see. Frida says he will only confirm what he has told you, and it will line up with the word of God. Thank you for that. Let me say that one more time. He will confirm. He will only confirm what he has told you, and it will line up with the word of God. That's the truth. That's a good word. Thank you, Frida. That's a good word. That's, that's, what, that's what we need to keep in our mind. That's why we have to know what God's word says. We have to know what God's word says. We have to know what God's word says. Otherwise, somebody else can tell us, here's God's word for you. And we're so ignorant of God's word. It, we're, not, we're not even thinking, wow, wow, that, that's so, you know. I, I've had so many people prophesy over me and I've had so many piece of people prophesy over me. But if you know God's word, then you have to know. That's, that's how you know. Oh, that really is in the Bible. And I'm going to pray about it. I'm, I'm going to seek God's face. And I'm going to see if that's what he has for me. I hope it is. But I, I can't wish it into existence. I can't talk it up in my head until uh, God says, Okay, all right, you can, you can have whatever. Or you can do whatever. Or you can live however. I, I'm just not going to do that. That is, that's why we have to have our own relationship with God. Right. 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 It would have been easy for my husband to say, <clears throat> I've gone to church all summer in most of my life. My dad is a well-known evangelist. But besides that, he's not just a well-known evangelist. He is a true, true man of God. I mean, Steve watched his dad. Steve knew his dad. He knew he wasn't one way in the pulpit and a thousand different ways when he was out of the pulpit. T.L. Lowry was T.L. Lowry all the time. All the time. All the time. <clears throat> We went out on a boat ride with him down here on the river one time, and he had on a suit, and Steve said, so help me, Dad. So help me, Dad. You have got to get you something else. And T.L. said, I just wouldn't feel comfortable, you know? <laughs> what a funny guy he was. So it would have been easy because everybody prophesied over Steve. Oh, you're going to be this, and you're going to be that, and you're going to be this, and you're going to be that. But I remember the day that God spoke to Steve directly, that God spoke to me, the two of us, and said, here's what I want you to do. Here's what I want you to do. T.L. never called him into the ministry. T.L. never forced us to be the pastors of National. God spoke it. We prayed about it. We fasted. God kept speaking it. When you have a relationship with God, when you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, then you know when he is speaking to you. You know what he is telling you, and you're listening, and you're learning, and you're knowing, and that's when it happens. Psalm, oh, thank you, Pauline. Psalm 131.2 is the scripture about the weaned child. Thank you. Frida said, I could see him mowing the lawn in a suit and tie. No, ma'am. No. No. That would be Mildred or Steve. <laughs> he had his limitations. 
he had his limitations. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your word. I thank you for your word. We're asking today that you heal our land, that you heal our people and set them free. Lord, that you would deliver from bondage. We pray, Lord, that we would seek your face and that we would hear your voice. That during this time of reflection, that during this time of restoration, that during this time while we are seeking revival, Lord, that you would send revival again. Do it again, Lord. Do it again. Touch our minds today. Touch our spirits today. Give us peace and give us freedom in Christ's name. Amen. 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 So, um, for those of you who are wondering what I'm going to do with this yummy piece of banana bread with uh, a whole lot of um, whipped cream. You know, um, Paula said, I know he's talking because my mind can't conceive the things he has told me. You know, that's another thing. is Sometimes God is telling you to do something and you're thinking, I either can't do that or I do not want to do that. And that's, that a lot of times is my key for it being... God, is that something you want me to do? And and then, <clears throat> you know, like he just <clears throat> sends people to help me with that, or or he sends technology to help me with that. And then it's then it's one of those, okay, okay, yeah, I get it. So yeah. So in case you're wondering what I'm gonna do with this yummy piece of banana bread, and, and I am trying to lose uh 10 pounds here, and so um I don't know. Maybe I'll let you know tomorrow. Maybe I'll do the right thing and not eat it. Because um, it's not my birthday. It's not. It's not my birthday. My birthday's in March. I'm thinking about it, though. I love you guys. I'll talk to you tomorrow. Don't forget, Wednesday is Francis Krause's uh, birthday party at our church. It's a drive-by. But if you cannot come, please, please, please send a card or a little something, um, Barbara said, go ahead. <laughs> you know me so well, Barbara. Um, <clears throat> uh, please send a card or just some little something, um, please. Uh, it's Frances' birthday. Her husband died several years ago, and she is battling cancer, and it would be such a blessing to Francis Krause, K-R-A-U-S-E. Love you, Pauline. God bless you. Bye-bye.